Thank you, Yoel. Uh, good morning. So today I will be presenting key insights from a background paper titled Wealth Creation for Expanding the Middle Class in the Philippines. This paper was prepared jointly with my colleagues, Dr. Roel Briones, and uh, also Dr. Uh, John Paulo Rivera, uh, uh, who just recently joined us at the IBS. And this provides a context for the theme of this year's Development Policy Research Month on securing a future for all by growing a resilient middle class. In this presentation, I will firstly discuss what do we mean by middle class and where do the middle class reside? Then I will proceed to describing the middle class in more detail, how they live, demographic characteristics, educational attainment, and education of children, labor and employment, assets and, and amenities, based on the 2021 Family Income and Expenditure Survey conducted by the Philippine Statistics Authority. You might wonder why 2021, and we thought that the PSA already released the 2023 data, particularly on poverty. However, we should note that while last month the, the PSA did release poverty statistics based on the 2023 Family Income and Expenditure Survey, but micro data for this survey has not yet been released. So anyway, so we're just focusing on data on 20, uh, based on 2021. Finally, we will also try to answer a basic question. Given our growth trajectories have changed because of COVID, can we sustain the middle class growth? We suggest a pathway for middle class expansion focusing on four key areas. We should note that Ambition 2040 articulates the middle class, the country's dream of a predominantly middle class society where no one is poor. This is largely because the middle class plays a crucial role in economic growth, stability, and sustainable development. A strong and growing middle class drives domestic consumption and investment, provides a source of human capital for boosting productivity and competitiveness, and contributes to social and political stability by fostering a stronger state in the nation's development. In the literature, the definition of middle class, just like poverty, has been contentious. There is no single definition. Economists tend to define the middle class in terms of either absolute thresholds in per capita income or expenditure in purchasing power parity or PPP dollars, or in relative terms with respect to the average or median income. Social scientists, on the other hand, use a non-monetary metric. In the Philippines, some market researchers make use of a composite index to divide the entire population into five socioeconomic classes, A, B, C, D, E. While some statisticians like my predecessor, Dr. Virola of the NSCB, made use of a cluster analytic approach. In our paper, we adopt an income-based definition of the middle class following a methodology that I espoused way back in 2018, where we define the middle class as households with per capita incomes between two to 12 times the official poverty line. This amounts to about a monthly family income in 2021 of between 25,000 pesos per month to around 145,000 for a family of five. Based on this definition, the middle class in the Philippines has grown from about 28.5% of the population in 1991 to about 40% in 2021. However, this growth has not been consistent over time. The COVID pandemic appears to have reversed some of the gains made in recent years. The middle class was actually already about 44% in 2018. And 
of course, uh, we if we're going to think of the 2023 data, maybe the middle class would grow back again to around maybe four and five percent. Um, just because uh, we know that the PSA already has mentioned that poverty rates in 2023 have actually reduced from the levels that uh, we had in 2021. The question is, how can we grow the middle class to be around, say, 80% in the next few years? As of 2021, the National Capital Region, Calabarzon, and Central Luzon have the highest concentration of middle class households. In NCR, three out of five persons are from the middle class, while in uh, 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 CAR, half, uh, about 51% belong to middle income. Meanwhile, Calabarzon has the same share of low and middle class uh, income classes, around 49.6%. As of 2021, in most regions, low-income families are the majority. This might still change depending on the data from 2023. In 2021, however, the majority, about 60% of Filipinos, belong to low-income families with per capita incomes below twice the poverty line. That's around 25000 per family five. Calabarzon, Central Luzon, and Central Visayas had the highest shares of low-income family, uh, low-income persons collectively, accounting for about 23% of the total income, uh, low-income of population in the Philippines. On the other hand, the middle-income class comprised around 40% of the population in 2021, most of whom are residing in Metro Manila, Calabarzon, and Central Luzon and together contribute about 52% of the total middle-income Filipinos. Only 0.9% of Filipinos had high incomes uh, defined as around 20 times the poverty line, around uh, maybe about 200, about maybe about uh, more than about, say, more than around 150, more or less 145,000 for a family of five. Majority of these high-income families also con are concentrated in the NCR, Calabarzon, and Central Visayas, contributing about 40% to the total high-income population. Though not shown directly in this graph here, the middle class is predominantly urban, with about 61% of urban residents belonging to the middle class in 2021, compared to around 34% of rural residents. This has been more or less the same story across the years, even prior to the pandemic. What is shown in this graph here is that in 2021, most of urban residents are low income, but not poor. This is a big change compared to the profile prior to the COVID pandemic, particularly in 2018, when most urban residents were middle income class. Those from rural areas are dominated by rural, by low income, but not poor, whether in 2018 or in 2021. Middle class households tend to be smaller than low income households with an average household size of 3.6 members compared to 5.0 for low income households in 2021. The most common Household types among Filipino families, particularly low-income households, are adult couples with children and adult couples with children and other adults. Low-income households are more likely to have larger, multi-generational families compared to higher-income households. Other adult combinations with children households are more common in low- and middle-income families than in upper income families. Middle class households allocate a larger share of their expenditure to education, 1.3%, health, 3.2%, and transportation, 8.8%, compared to low income households. However, their spending on these items is still much lower than that of high income households. 
in 2021, wages were the primary income source for middle-income households, about 51%, followed by overseas remittances, 8.3%, and domestic income transfers, around 6%. On the other hand, low-income households relied more on domestic income transfers, 11%, and less on overseas remittances, 3.5%, with wages accounting for about 47% of their total income. Also, high-income households receive a higher share of their income from overseas remittances, 10%, compared to middle-income and low-income households, while domestic transfers, 2.7%, and wages contributed less to their total income. The middle class has significantly higher levels of educational attainment compared to low-income classes. In 2021, 40% of middle-class Filipinos aged 15 and above had completed college compared to only 14.5% of their low-income counterparts. While the overall share of out-of-school children among middle-income families is relatively low, 4%, there are still significantly significant challenges in ensuring early childhood education, particularly for five-year-olds. Nearly a quarter of five-year-old children from middle-income families as of 2021 are not attending school. The middle class is more likely to be engaged in formal salaried employment compared to low-income classes. In 2021, about four out of five employed middle-class persons had permanent jobs. The primary source of income for middle-class households are wages and salaries, followed by entrepreneurial activities and overseas remittances, as I mentioned earlier. Overseas workers play a significant role in the income of Filipino families. About 5% of Filipino families have an OFW, and the presence of an OFW, however, varies across income clusters. With high-income families, 9.2% of them, having a much higher rate compared to middle income, 5%, and low income, around 1% of families. However, the majority of families in OFWs belong to the middle class. Middle class households have higher levels of asset ownership and as access to amenities compared to low income um, households. In 2021, 98% of middle class households in urban areas owned a mobile phone. 93% owned a television and 46% own a computer. Access to safe drinking water is also much higher among middle class households. Nearly universal access to electricity, uh, about 99.8% for middle income compared to 93% um, for low income and 100% for high income classes. Access to safe drinking water is also much higher for middle-class households. The COVID pandemic, however, as I already mentioned, has had a significant impact on the middle class in the country. Many middle-class households have experienced job losses, reduced incomes, and increased education on health and expenditure. The pandemic has highlighted the vulnerability of some middle-class households, particularly those in the lower middle income segment. So to harness the potential of the middle class as a driver of inclusive growth, we need a strategy not only to expand the middle class sustainably, but also to transform it to a resilient middle class that can withstand welfare risks from mega trends that can further heighten existing inequalities. We thus propose a four-pronged a pathway for middle class expansion and transformation towards resiliency. This comprises first, promoting social justice in natural resource management and climate change, which is crucial for ensuring the benefits of economic growth are shared equitably. This includes strengthening community based natural resource management frameworks, investing in sustainable livelihood and value chain development for resource-dependent communities, mainstreaming climate change adaptation, and disaster risk re reduction in local development planning and budgeting, developing a just transition plan for workers and communities affected by the shift towards a low-carbon economy, 
Second, harnessing new opportunities in trade and investments for MSMEs, which play a vital role in broad-based growth for the country. Harnessing these new opportunities in trade and investments, particularly through re regional economic integration and global value chains, can help MSMEs overcome barriers to growth and competitiveness. This includes strengthening export promotion programs and trade facilitation measures, providing targeted support to MSMEs in the form of export coaching, trade financing, and market intelligence, implementing reforms to reduce barriers to FDI and improving the ease of doing business, and of course, promoting innovation and technology adoption among MSMEs. Third, uh, we want we want to make sure that we're ensuring a future-ready workforce and social protection for um, the, uh, our... Um, uh, we know that human capital development is a key enabler of middle-class growth. So ensuring a future-ready re ready workforce and also uh, social protection is crucial for enabling more Filipinos to adapt to the changing demands of the labor market and to benefit from the opportunities of the digital economy. And this includes investing in quality education and skills development programs, particularly in STEM and digital skills, strengthening in industry academic linkages and promoting work-based learning programs, expanding social protection coverage to informal and gig workers, promoting lifelong learning and reskilling opportunities for workers, and finally, improving digital governance and public service delivery. We know that digital technologies are transforming economies and societies, creating new opportunities for entrepreneurship, employment, and learning. Improving digital governance and public service delivery can help enhance the efficiency, transparency, and accountability of government services and create new opportunities for citizen engagement and participation. So we list in this slide some past studies on the middle class, and more importantly, we'd like to point out in conclusion that realizing this vision of a predominantly middle class society in the Philippines, as stated in Ambition 2040, will require bold and concerted action across multiple fronts. It will also necessitate effective leadership, coordination and collaboration among government, the private sector, civil society, and development partners. By putting in place a comprehensive agenda for middle-class expansion, the Philippines can build a more resilient, equitable, and prosperous future for all Philippines. Thank you for your attention.